The reading is from Mark, chapter 6, starting at verse 14. John the Baptist beheaded. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John, and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Thank you for that reading, Adrian. So a gruesome reading this morning. And in previous weeks, Jacqueline has told us about Jesus curing a woman of her long-term hemorrhage whilst he was on his way to raise a young child from her deathbed. And last week, Russ told us about Jesus sending out his 12 disciples, telling them to depend totally on the hospitality of the people they would serve as they traveled through those small villages of Galilee. And they went out spreading his message of repentance and expanding his ministry of healing and casting out demons. And then today I get the beheading of John the Baptist. And it feels like an interruption to those stories. And Mark likes to interject one story with another. With another. And Russ told us last week that these are known as a Mark and Sandwich. Thank you, Russ. So in today's reading, it's Herod that's the main character, not Jesus. And this is one of two accounts in Mark where Jesus isn't physically present. The other one being where Peter denies Jesus. But of course, Jesus is close by. John the Baptist had publicly rebuked Herod for seducing and marrying his brother's wife. Now Herod didn't seem greatly offended by this, but Herodias, his wife, was. And it was her that insisted on John's arrest. And here we see her um, insist on his murder. And it's a grim story of her hatred and Herod's weakness. Herodias was bitter and she held a grudge against John for exposing her sin. She worked constantly to destroy him. But Herod was somehow attracted to John. He wanted to hear him and he listened to him. But Herod reveals all the weakness of his character in this story. So if this is the meat in the sandwich, we might be tempted to kind of pick it out and disregard it or look for a different flavour of sandwich altogether. 
But when we look at it, it seems that Mark has given this account for a few reasons. Firstly, it seems to provide the reason why Jesus sent out the 12 disciples. John the Baptist had always pointed beyond himself to Jesus. This Jesus, the Son of God, was going to come to bring God's promise of forgiveness and deliverance from evil and death. And when John is first arrested, then Jesus begins his own ministry in Galilee. And now here we see as John is beheaded, Jesus sends out the 12 to continue that ministry, to continue that message of repentance and to add to it the authority and power to cast out demons and to heal the sick. Jesus beginning his ministry and sending out his disciples is the dawning of God's kingdom that John had always proclaimed proclaiming a reign of peace with God and with one another. Of course, the disciples didn't see this. They couldn't see the full picture. They didn't know of the imp impending death of Jesus. They didn't know of his resurrection to come. They didn't even really know who he fully was. They only knew that God was at work in Israel and that people needed to come to a place of need and then God could begin work in their lives. And this is where the gospel starts, with repentance. And we need to remember that too. We need to know that repentance isn't about pleading or begging for forgiveness in order to have a relationship with God or to maintain our relationship with him. When you look at the word in Greek for repent, it means to change your mind and to think differently. In other words, you have a revelation of truth that changes your mind, that then causes you to think and behave differently because you know that truth. Now Herod and Herodias were unable to face their sin. So therefore they were unable to repent and unable to accept God's grace and forgiveness. But we can continue to choose to do that and repentance isn't a one-off act, it's an ongoing thing. Secondly, this story can also be seen as a foreshadowing of the ultimate end for Jesus. Mark shows us that John was the forerunner of Jesus' message and ministry but also the forerunner of his death. John is righteous and suffers silently, and so will Jesus. Both Herod and Pilate were Roman officials, and they were both weak in the face of social pressure, and both end up condemning innocent men to death. And if we look at this story as a parable that speaks to leadership in government and institutional life in our own time, we know that people in positions of power are subject to powerful pressures that pose a threat to their own security. Add to that pride and greed and need for prestige. Under the pressure of all these influences, the courage to serve truth and the, and the common good can really fade away. Now the results might not be as gruesome as John's execution, but the damage can be more extensive. And I guess we've seen a lot of that throughout this pandemic, people abusing positions of trust and power, succumbing to their own needs and desires where it appears to be one rule for them and a different one for us. However, it's not for us to pass judgment on the sins of the powerful few. Today's reading reminds us that John's message of repentance was for many. John didn't only call Herod to repentance, but the whole of Judea, which is to say all of us too. And when we're faced with terrible choices of our own, we might be tempted to turn aside from what we know to be right for fear of the consequences. And what we do under pressure often shows what we're really like. And we might need to consider, to stop and consider, whose opinions matter to us most and whether we use pride to cover up our own insecurity. So thirdly and finally, Mark also seems to see a relationship between missionaries and martyrdom, between discipleship and death. 
which of course mirrors Jesus' teaching in Mark 8.34 where he says, If someone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Mark appears to be saying the same thing in sandwiching John the Baptist's death into the mission of the Twelve. That discipleship may lead to suffering. And of course we're all sent out as disciples of Christ and this call to ministry can be a call to suffering. We've considered before what it means to die to self. That we need to deny ourselves because our very nature is to go against what God wants and we need to bring our thoughts and behaviour in line with God's truth. And just as we see Jesus send out the 12 disciples with nothing, our ministry may sometimes take us beyond our own resources and need for rest, but God often does his work in and through our weakness. And we'll see this a bit more next week as the disciples return and Jesus acknowledges that they need rest. And then they face the next challenge which seems impossible with absolutely no resources to be able to achieve it, but they're taught about depending on God. And the assurance of God's love and acceptance of all of us gives us the freedom to seek truth and goodness for our neighbours and for the world. We are freed beyond ourselves to reflect Christ in the care of the needs of others. We can choose to love exactly how we're loved by God. And even when we're faced with the terrible choices of an imperfect world, choices where it can seem impossible to know what to do or what is right and when love and courage don't seem sufficient we always have the unconditional assurance in the agony of our uncertainties that we absolutely have the certainty of God's love and we will always have that. I think there are three key points that we need to take away from this. Firstly, that repentance is an ongoing process, not a one-off event. And really, this ongoing process is the very fruit of our salvation. Secondly, being a disciple of Christ means dying to self and bringing our thoughts and behaviour in line with God's truth. And finally, and most importantly, and this is where it probably fits with the bread on either side of the sandwich, that dependence on God is an expression of our faith. It's not something that you only draw on in an emergency or a crisis, but really it's a daily expression of our confidence is in God and in his love for us. So I'd like to finish with a prayer. Gracious Father, give us diligence to seek you and wisdom to find you today. May our ears hear your voice, our eyes see your goodness, and our tongues proclaim your name as we commit our lives to pleasing you. Amen.